Welcome everyone, Questine here with a discussion about the dwarves in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. It is turn 60 and this campaign has grown brindle and Wolf 1 has been purged quite very thoroughly. And I've sold most of it to Nakari. I'm going to get the military alliance with Nakari. Well, I already did get the military alliance with Nakari, and then Nakari broke it off when I declared war on a particular faction and asked my allies to join in. Yeah, he's not really trustworthy, but had to sell Wolf 1 to someone because it's an uninhabitable climate. Now, I didn't just go for Wolf 1 for the hell of it. There is a particular reason. But looking at this campaign, turn 60, I gain control over all of Wolf 1, Nagrond, and... <laughs> well, let's just say we've been going places in this particular campaign, and we are slaughtering the elves, as it should be in a campaign like this. Like, half a Lorn has been turned into a theme park for uh, for the dwarves. I'll get into the reasoning behind going after half a Lorn and Wolf 1 in just a bit, though. But let's start covering the changes. And I, honestly, I'm not quite sure where to begin. I already covered the Empire. That already has a substantial rework. So let's just say, um, I think the dwarves really go a lot further than that. So, um, let me start with the new grudge system, how this works, because that has been completely changed. So you now have a top bar over here. And what this does is that, dependent on how many grudges you've settled in an Age of Reckoning, so you start in an Age of Reckoning, it expires after 10 turns, and then you can start another one right after, or you can, or you can put it on the lay for 10 turns, but you'll require to do more grudges in order to complete that, to get to 100%. You gotta love, the, the dwarves kind of feel like the Black Templars of Warhammer 40k. We have just finished one crusade. Well, we're gonna declare another one, and another one right after that. Now, the way this works is, dependent on the number of grudges you do, you get either benefits or downsides. For the most part, it's gonna be benefits. Effectively, and the way Creative Assembly has stated it, is that... You will not gain the lowest tier unless you're literally doing nothing. Like, you are expected to get every other tier except Elgi. I love how they call it Elgi. And by the way, this is representing your beard uh, size. So the more grudges you sell, the longer the beard that you have over here at the top. It's a beard icon itself. So what this does is it affects growth, it affects control, and it affects grudge settlers, which are not quite regiments or a noun, but they're just basically special units that do have a unit cap per army. You can increase it for various ways. But these are units you can acquire by selling regis. So every tier beyond the first one, the Elgi one, will give you some grudge settlers once an Age of Reckoning has been completed. completed. So at tier two, you can get Quarlers and Slayers, at uh, tier 3, you can get Quarlers, Slayers, Grudge Throwers, Longbeards. Tier 4, um, uh, uh, tier four you, get, you get the addition of Iron Drakes and Hammers, special kinds of Iron Drakes and Hammers that are better than the baseline variant. And at the final tier, you get all Grudge Seller units, which effectively translates into Flame Cannons. I think I may have one over here, so that's a Grudge Seller Flame Cannon. I'll talk about this guy in just a bit. Um, and you get Growth Control benefits, upkeep benefits for those specific units, and if you get to the highest tier, and only at the highest tier, you'll spawn a temporary army of grudge sellers. This army is disposable, it lasts 10 turns, it cannot be replenished, it will spawn in your capital, so it's a bit uh, useless for me in this Grum Brindle campaign at this point. It is led by the new Demon Slayer. I do not have the DLC installed, wish to point this out, I don't have the DLC installed, so you'll still get this army, you'll still get this Demon Slayer. He's not really a proper lord, he doesn't have a skill line, but you'll get this army for 10 turns even without the DLC. And this is basically a doomstack. I mean, even if these were default slayers and longbeards and hammers and all that, this would still be a doomstack. By the way, embargo policy based on Creative Assembly has told content creators is like anything, essentially anything that happens in a regular campaign, we can show off. It's If it's not something that only happens with the DLC. If Creative Assembly has a problem with that, Feel free to let me know, and yeah, I'll remove the section. But this is a doomstack. So 
these guys, these grudge seller units, what do they offer? Well, you got to take a look at the new book of grudges over here. So you get quarrelers uh, with two-handed weapons, grudge sellers. What do they have? They have shield breaker ability, so they can reduce missile block chance, and they have a bonus versus infantry in both melee and ranged. Slayers have sundering attacks and extreme, uh, extremely daring death blow. So if they drop below 25% HP, they get 15% physical resistance melee attack. Regular slayers have death blow, and death blow is still going to buff their weapon damage and armor piercing attack. Not quite by as much, but it won't give them physical resistance. So grass slayer slayers have physical resistance and melee attack when they get to low HP. And also interesting about slayers, uh, slayers are now changed to never have their weapon strength reduced during a battle. Grudge throwers, uh, grudge seller, grudge throwers, have shrapnel, projectiles, and monstrous impact ability. So you're reducing speed. Uh, it's just like every unit has some buff. Uh, like it's uh, something specific. Like longbeards have guardian and expert charge defense. Longbeards are two-handed weapons. Uh, hammers have frenzy and frostbite attacks compared to the regular version. Iron drakes, this is pretty interesting. They have 120 range and flammable attacks. Uh, so if we compare, I mean, regular iron drakes have flammable attacks regardless, but the range is increased from 80 to 120. And I've mentioned this in the Empire video. I'll mention it again here, ranged works significantly better with the patch than it does before. Like, so it's not like they just have extra range. No, they genuinely work far better. Um, like in general, Iron Drakes were far better from what I've seen. I do need to do some thorough testing on that to be certain, but from what I've noticed, range does work better. You do get gyrocopters who have troll hammer torpedoes and of course the gyrocopter bomb. So, um, these essentially are a variant of the brimstone guns who have a flamethrower attached to them right now. Not sure if they had that before. I think they didn't. No, I, I don't think brimstone guns had a flamethrower. These guys do. So they've changed gyrocopters. There was also more entities, I think, per unit. I could be wrong on that, but I do think there's a lot more entities per gyrocopter unit. So yeah, gyrocopters are more useful. And troll hammers... Um, Pretty damn useful as well when you're think when you're looking at uh, at that. And flame cannons, they get increased um, armor and shrapnel projective, so they're doing um, damage. Now this army spawns at the highest level. The units in the army are randomized, so you can get a very useful army or a less useful army. But regardless of what units you're going to get here, it is going to be pretty powerful. And you can increase the number of units in this army with research. So. Grudges, really powerful right now, significantly changed as well. Um, Confederation, another thing with the Great Book of Grudges is, um, let's actually talk about how you gain grudges. So every faction that you might hate for whatever reason has uh, grudges attached to it. And there's a lot of them as well. Like for instance, Valkia, who I'm friendly with actually has 217. Uh, Durfu over here, who I'm about to wipe out right here, has 912 on the Selm. So you can get grudges on Selmans or heroes. So like uh, Grom's capital has a thousand grudges attached to it, for instance. So you can get a lot of grudges. It, the, it, I think there's some scalability issues a bit with it, because like right now for me to get to high age is required, going to require 42,000 grudges. You know that saying, if you're on a path of revenge, dig two graves, where we're going to need a lot more than two graves. That's the mentality of the dwarves. That's always been the mentality of the dwarves. Like, we're going to need hundreds of thousands of graves. We are on a crusade against all things evil. And maybe even a couple of things that aren't. You can get some grudges against order factions. The dwarves really hate the elves. So it's like any elven faction will get a significant number of grudges. It, like Imric, for instance, has a lot of grudges here. And it's not because I'm at war with him. No, it's because he's a freaking elf that he has grudges. So it's like you get more grudges against elves than you get against chaos. Which is a bit weird, I admit. I mean, they hate the elves in the lore, but maybe not quite that much. So... Yeah, that's, uh, that's a bit silly, but very dwarven. Uh, Confederation-wise, you, uh, your number of grudges, or settled grudges, does increase. So it's 
it's a value that always increases, right? So for instance, here I have tw a total of almost 80,000 settled grudges. To confederate a lord, like it might start at like 16,000 settled grudges that you need to earn, but it also increases depending on how many grudges they've done, how far you're in a campaign. So for instance, over here, I think like Belagar was like 40,000 by the time I was able to confederate him. I've also confederated Forgrim who was like 60,000, I think. And Ungrum is like 71,000, Fork is 72,000. And you can confederate from a distance. This is nice for Grum Brindle's campaign. There's no specific campaign changes. There's some Lord Skill Line changes in a camp in a Dwarven campaign, but there's not necessarily specific campaign changes for individual campaigns. But there are specific changes to campaigns because with the new grudge system, for instance, like what Grumbrindle consider here, all the armies that I actually built in this area, mice like this one, were um, like they've been fighting in this particular area of the map. The armies that I used to conquer here were gained from uh, Belagar and Forgrim. Now, of course, it varies, but being able to confederate from a distance is very useful. It means that in every Dwarven campaign, you can get access to Grumbrindle without using something like Recruit, Defeat, the Legendary Lords. It means in a Grumbrindle campaign, you can get access to the entirety of the Dwarven realm through that. And it's a guaranteed confederation. You can still confederate with diplomacy, though I think... Um, or at one point, you might be able to get confederation diplomacy. Like right now, I can't do confederation because obviously I have the penalty. But I think initially in a campaign, you can't confederate another Legendary Lord. You can obviously confederate the minor factions like Zufbar and all that. But you can't confederate the Legendary Lord. But at one point, it will be available for regular diplomacy. So you're not just limited in terms of like, oh, let's just do the grudge, uh, the Legendary Lord grudges and handle that. You know, that's not exactly how that works. Uh, in terms of Legendary grudges, we get a couple of things. So we now have an underway uh, network that we can utilize. So let me just recruit a lord, this may work. So the way this works is you need to control basically all the world's edge mountains. So effectively everything from here in Azax territory all the way here in Blightwater need to be controlled by dwarves. Now I don't have control of Blightwater, um, um, Emmerich has beaten me to it, so I'll just load a save where I do, and I'll go over that. So, a couple of turns uh, later, I've been able to put Nakari in his place and get an alliance with him. I also made an alliance with Valkia. Like, it's the hilarity of this campaign, or very close to an alliance with Valkia. I just need to take some territory to sell to her, so very close to that. It's like, it's hilarious. We will literally ally Chaos to slaughter the elves. But anyway, with regards to the way the underway works, so you get the legendary grudge here, right? And then this restores the underway network. Now, the way the underway network works is that it opens passages in various locations. The ones that you unlock by default are all the way from here in the Green Mountains, in the Northern Green Mountains, to the north over here in Karak uh, Vlag. So you can actually teleport right next to uh, Astrogoth if you want to, Karak Adrin, the Dwarven Capital, and all the way in the south. Those are the ones that, uh, accessed by default. So what you do is you need to send a Lord to a settlement that has an underway network location, and then you can teleport them to a location. Quite very powerful about this is that you do have, uh, quite very powerful about this is you keep all your movement range. The passageways are closed by default for eight turns. An interesting little thing about this, you can teleport an army, take over a settlement, and then recruit another army and recruit regiments of renown and grudge throwers, cause, uh, or grudge sellers. So the grudge sellers, though, all those units that I covered earlier, they get added to a pool, like mercenary pool, and you can recruit them for no cost, and they don't cost more that much more in terms of upkeep to maintain, and they're just fly out better uh, units. But as you can see, there's a limit. By default, it's five. You can increase it through research, and I think there's some skill lines as well for the Legendary Lords. Like the campaigns may be the same in theory for the uh, for the Legendary Lords, are markedly different, I think, because of the new grudges. Um, but their skill lines have been adapted in some way, shape, or form. So let me go over the Legendary Grudges. If you restore the underway, you, all the grudges give you some settled grudges. Quest battles also give you 
uh, sell grudges. Uh, so the most basic one, the ones you're, you're going to want to do in every campaign except uh, Grumbrindle and even in Grumbrindle's campaign is just slower, is restored the Android network because yeah, teleportation is powerful. Uh, the second one is wipe out the elves and you get the landmark Aval's Anvil. Do I think that it's worth all the effort that it requires to do so? Well, make your decision about that. You do get Oaf Gold. Uh, so you get exotic animals, 20 cages, and Oaf Gold and a random ancillary every five turns. Is that worth it considering it's an uninhabitable climate? Uh, that's going to be up to you, really. But purge the elves, basically, is what this game is saying. Then purge more, more elves and lizardmen. So it's like wipe out basically all the factions dwarves might have an issue with over here for the Halls of Ancestor. So that's a landmark we already know. Just going to toggle Fog of War over here. So um, this is the landmark. It's been the same, I think, for uh, from the beginning. I'm not sure if there is necessarily any uh, major landmark changes over here. But yeah, there there are obviously uh, some new landmarks, however. You get a lot of Oath Gold, 2,500 if you do that. So basically some of these grudges are designed for a specific campaign. Like Wipe Out the Elves, yeah, that's for Grumbrindle. Restore Dundry, that's for Ungrim and Forgrim and Malachi. Malachi, uh, by the way, just to go over this quickly, he starts in Krakadrak. That's... <laughs> Ooh, the Unholy Trio. Let me just uh, give you my perspective on that. The Unholy Trio of Azag... Um, uh, not Azag... Um, of Azazel, Frat, and Trog, and and um, and Trog are gonna have a really, really bad day at the moment with Malachi over there. Basically, it's kind of, I guess, an indirect buff to Keyslev because, like, without having to deal with Malachi being able to stop Trog at least for a time dead in his tracks, you don't have the same damn pressure that he did before. So, indirect buff for Keyslev. Uh, you do have a grudge against Skaven, so take Skaven while I tell, uh, help it. And when I say take it, it doesn't have to be you, it has to be a Dwarven faction. So, like, as long as these factions get eliminated and the territory gets controlled by Dwarves. So, for instance, if Forek wiped out all these factions, already, all these factions were wiped out by someone, you would get this grudge complete. And if Forek built uh, uh, the Halls of Dancers, if Dwarves took control of uh, uh, Skaven Blight and help it, you would get this grudge completed. There's a grudge against cast dwarves and Grimgore, which restores the underway network in, in Uskolak and Karakazorn. So there's two extra locations for the underway network that are in uh, Uskolak and Karakazorn. So if you want to go east, you do have availability if you do so. Or more realistically, to go from there back home if you want there. Uh, a grudge against Durfu and Orion, which gives you a landmark building in the Oak of Ages, which this gives you some pretty damn substantial benefits. So this gives you 100 timber production beyond the 100 timber production from just controlling the Oak of Ages. 15% upkeep for Quarreler, Ranger, Bolt Thrower, Grudge Thrower, Base Missile da uh, Damage, and Construction Costs for all buildings. That is a biblical of all of economic benefits right there. So yeah, purge the Wood Elves. They're not really useful allies anyway. Sell the territory to Bretonia. One particular point to make here is that you do need to take the territory and complete the grudge first, but you can then sell the territory here and not lose the effect, right? So I could still construct a landmark. Like Wolf One, for instance, I only sold territory to Nakari after I completed uh, the grudge over here because you do need to control the three main elven cities in, Lof in Wolf One. Um, an an anti-Norskan grudge that reduces the Undervoy network from 8 to Five. I assume eight is the default one, pretty sure about that, unless there's some research that affects that. Uh, grudge against the Dark Elves, that adds a unique Dwarf Lord. I'm not quite sure where I put said Dwarf Lord. It's got to be somewhere here. I think it might... Yeah, the, no, no, it's not this one. Trying to find him. There's a lot of stuff. Okay, so I get this guy. So it's the Grudge Striker. It reduces recruitment cost by minus 15 and gives you a global recruitment duration. Uh, also, he's immortal, pretty certain about that. I'll talk about Lord and Hero changes in just a bit uh, with respect uh, to, uh, to that. 
Uh, you get so you get a grudge against Norska. You get the grudge for a Nick Dwarf Lord. You get the grudge that increases grudge seller capacity for per army. So by default, that's five, and then you get the two seven. So this is not affecting the Doom stack you get that temporary army. It's affecting your regular army. So you can get more of those grudge seller units if you just basically defeat Queek and Scarsnick. Pretty pretty nice. Very interesting here. Silver Pinnacle, Neferata, directly mentioned right here. So this is just basically occupy the Silver Pinnacle and you'll get the benefit. What is the benefit? Well, it's just basically unlocking this particular landmark. So a lot of income, immunity to vampire contrition, and yeah, it reduces vampire corruption. Which might be useful when paired with this one in Naga Shizar, because yeah, that's a lot of vampire corruption no, it's the same effect right but uh, this is one this one is available to everyone whereas that one is particular for dwarves and that is all there is for grudges we're just getting started moving on to salmon changes well one of the things about salmon is that there are now key dwarf salmon so these add grudges to anyone that controls them unless they are dwarf. So any faction that will control these elements, doesn't matter if it's empire, doesn't matter if it's like high elves or vampires or anything like that, they'll get extra grudges from that. Gorog, which is actually um, important when we're talking about elements, has been changed. It no longer gives growth, but you do have plenty of growth over here through the Age of Reckoning. Um, and it's, as I stated, it's difficult to really get Elgi. You basically need to be AFK. That's the in design intent. Though I'm not quite sure CA really intended things to go as crazy as they are. But you get 50 unit experience and 10% income from buildings as well as a bit of control. Which control, yeah, does help with growth in uh, settlements. But okay, talking about settlements. And oh my, are there are some re radical changes over here. First off, let's talk about military stuff. All heroes, old dwarf heroes, not quite sure about the slayers that are going to be added in the DLC, but all current dwarf heroes, be it runesmiths, fanes, and engineers, can now be acquired at tier 2, and all of their capacity can be increased at tier 3. And this is great, it means more heroes, heroes are fun, you get to play around with them more. The Holes of Oaths has been removed but you do get the hero capacity and hero recruiting rank. So there's, you could consider them some nerfs, but really, if you think the dwarves are nerfed in any substantial way, let me just say no. Um, so now you get hero capacity and hero recruiting rank for fanes at tier three. All units like dwarf warriors can now be recruited from any settlement. So you no longer just have miners, you can also get regular dwarf warriors, which is pretty nice. Gives you more army variety and moving for enemy territory. The Barracks of Tier 1 gives you Dwarf Warriors Grey Weapons and Miners with Blasting Charges, Tier 2 Quarrelers, the both Varians and Fanes, and Tier 3 Longbeards as it currently is. And you'll be constructing more Barrackses. New Building Chain in the Arms Foundry gives you Thunderers, Iron Drakes, and Trollhammer Torpedoes. Not sure about any of the new units. I imagine Slayer heroes are going to be recruited at Tier 3. Which, like, if we only, like, if out of the Dwarf heroes... We uh, the only one that you actually need a tier free settlement are the Slayer heroes. That's perfectly fine by me. Not sure where all these here, uh, all the new heroes are going and units are going to be recruited from. I imagine there's some gonna that are gonna be in like the Slayer building and some in the Arms Foundry potentially. Um, you no longer need uh, to get a refactory for Bugman's Ranger, so you can just get the Ranger building in. Uh, Recruit that. That also adds a garrison of rangers with gray weapons over there. Uh, so that is certainly nice. Artillery-wise, you get, yeah, bolt throwers and grudge at tier 2. Cannons tier 3. Tier 4, you get organ guns and flame cannons. are really nice over there. Uh, for the runesmith building, you still recruit iron breakers at tier 4 and hammers uh, tier 3. So, like, unit recruitment is largely staying the same in terms of tiers, I think. But it's like, yeah, just the hero capacity has been changed. What has been very uh, substantially changed is the economic buildings. And also just the growth of the dwarf. So, main dwarf, so dwarf settlements, forget Karazakarat, because that's a special settlement. So, main dwarf settlements now start at 10 growth, 20, 30, 40, and 50. Substantial growth buff for dwarves. 
their growth was one of the worst aspects of the race. So that's been fixed. And now uh, the trading depot or yeah, the traders guild hall is now something you can't build if you have the toolmakers guild hall. So the toolmakers guild hall is still largely the same building in terms of money, the money it produces, but every single one of them that you build reduces construction costs starting at 5% going into 10% all the way to 15%. The traders guild hall produces slightly less money like 60 at tier 5 but also produces off gold and there's pros and cons with this you might just think oh i just want the construction cost benefit it's certainly very powerful it's certainly very useful but you may not necessarily want to go down that entire path with uh with that i, I think it depends on the province like obviously you can get a ridiculous level of construction cost reduction if you're in um if you're in a province with free uh, f- uh, three regions, four regions, like I might just get rid of this particular building over here, maybe build it here until I can get this to tier five. Um, but you can really reduce the construction cost of buildings in a dwarf campaign. Or you can get a bunch of old golds. I-, I think like in provinces with two settlements, it's probably better to get the old gold building because obviously that's going to be limited to like with the provinces you're only going to get 20 percent construction costs like dwarf buildings still are expensive but you have a lot of ways of reducing construction costs so with three regions or more probably you want to build a lot of these trinket markets but with uh with two maybe not so much especially not with one because you don't want off gold and you you no longer have the trade resource generated through the um, traders guild hall that is, you could consider that a nerf to the dwarf economy, but you're saving so much money for construction costs and you get upkeep benefits. So overall, you're actually making a lot more money. And because you no longer want free buildings and only two, you can get just basically get a bunch of these guys and a bunch of these ones and generate a lot of trade resource anyway. The percentage has been reduced, but yeah, to give you an idea in terms of trade uh, income, I'm generating like 2k, 3k from certain trade agreements. I have a massive empire, but the fact that I can produce trade resources for the drinking hall, basically, or the feast hall, is a nice benefit to the dwarf uh, economy. But of gold, you're gonna want it. You are gonna want. uh, You are gonna want of gold, because that's gonna tie into the new research tree that the dwarves have. This is, uh, the way I look at it, it's like, yeah, let's take what the cast dwarves did very well and put it here. So you don't have the intricate resource system that the cast dwarves have. Like, yeah, I would have liked to have that. I admit, like, if there's any particular disappointment, we didn't get that. But what we did get is still fairly substantial. So you get guilds and clans. So clans buff everything military. And there are some things that are instantly done research-wise, but that they cost off gold. All the way to very high level research that costs a thousand of gold each. So if you, so basically there's different tiers. You need to, cons- uh, you need to do a certain amount of research in the previous tier to unlock the next tier. So tier one, you know, tier one, you get access. Like once you do the basic research, tier two requires seven, tier three, uh, tier three requires five. I do think the guilds is far better, but there's uh, at least initially, but later on it's like, yeah, one grudge seller, so you can get up to eight. Uh, through grudges and uh, that research, minus 5% upkeep for all units. Age of Reckoning Grudge Seller Army, so that Doom stack that you can get can have two more units in it. So each of these is a thousand of gold. You're gonna want a lot of of gold. I'll talk about Forge in just a moment, because yeah, that's still there, though that also has been a change as well. In the guilds, and I'd strongly recommend going for the guilds, you can get things like rat poison very early on. One of the problems for dwarves is casualty replenishment. You can get 5% casualty replenishment, you can get construction time benefits, income benefits, construction time for military buildings, all that construction time for defense buildings, all that kind of good stuff, right? In, in yeah, incredible benefits for global recruitment, hero capacity. I'm not sure I need the hero capacity, considering how much hero capacity there is already. But if you really want it, you can get even more hero capacity and also hero recruit rank. I think the hero recruit rank, like for instance, Fane's Authority is good for the control aspect, but obviously like, yeah, research rate of corruption, all that. One, uh, and at the highest level, 
This is where it's a bit ridiculous. So you get construction guilds, which reduces construction time minus one for all buildings, keeping in mind that you already have construction time benefits for different types of buildings um, in your campaign. You also have a research that gives you 15% tradable resource production, construction uh, time for all infrastructure building. So what I'm saying here is like you get all you get all of that and then you get construction guilds, you can produce buildings as doors very, very quickly uh, in, in a campaign. Not sure if I have anything that I'm constructing right here, but like, so for instance, if I wanted to get to tier four dwarf hold or tier five, like it would take five turns over there, uh, three turns, all that. So yeah, you can construct buildings much faster, which means more unit capacity, which means a better economy faster. So it ends up scaling quite crazily. But then you go a bit even more insane because you do have Grand Throne Chamber, which gives you two population surplus for newly con captured settlements. So whenever you capture a settlement, once you have this, you'll get two surplus points. What this means is that you can build provinces like over here I have three surplus points and this is relatively recent in the campaign I have three surplus points that I'm getting there that is an incredible benefit I think from a late game perspective and then yeah you get the diplomatic benefit relations benefit which I don't necessarily think it was worth it but hey if you want to be happy with the empire might be useful if you go for the nemesis crown because of the diplomatic relations downside not sure how that works for the dwarves though like if it's increasing relations with all the wars or if it's increasing relations in the empire for everyone. So yeah, really powerful changes in terms of research, really powerful changes in terms of construction. And it's like, just, I think the results can speak for themselves. I'm generating 46,000 from trade. My building income is 86,000. I'm generating all, uh, 13, 130,000 gold per turn. Though I am only generating, uh, though actually even with Oath Gold, I'm generating 422 at this point. You can go for more Oath Gold or you can go for more money. That is really up to you in terms of what you want to do. In terms of the Forge, you no longer have the gray items in the Forge. So what they've done is they removed them. So the exploit that people use, which honestly was a really annoying thing to do, can no longer be done. Recycling costs 64 uh, green items and they cost 200 to make. So you're not just going to be spamming armors of destiny. I mean, you still get a pretty good amount of money, a pretty good amount of armors, but the way I'd see it is more useful later on in the campaign to go for the forge because early on you want of gold for research in a campaign. And there's going to be quite a lot of, you know, heavy of gold requirements for all this stuff. And it's really worth it. Whether or not you want to go max out uh, of gold or not, that's really going to be up to you. In terms of heroes, I'm going to use Forgrim because he's got... Uh, actually, let's start talking about Legendary Lords. There's been some skill line changes uh, over here in some way or another. Like, I haven't... Like, I have so much hero capacity. Like, just to give you an idea. I have so much hero capacity I haven't gotten to Forgrim stuff because it's like 27 Fanes, 24 Runesmiths, 20 Master Engineers. So it's like, yeah, Forgrim. I mean, Forgrim's skill line is still obviously very useful early on. But it's also been changed. So uh, he does have a new choice over here with like rune warded armor, master crafted weapon, and aura of endurance. This is shared with Fanes, though they have, I think it's a, it's a choice per one. So he still has at the top all the stuff that, you know, he usually has all the grudges against various uh, guys. Uh, some things have been changed a bit. Like Ancient Bloodline stays the same. So nothing to talk about there. Um, you do get an upkeep of long beards and hammers over there. But I think like all these ones have largely stayed the same. So he's still hero capacity. High King now gives you Age of Reckoning Grudge Seller Army has been increased by three over there. So I think it's what, 12 units by default or something like that. So you're getting a 15 uh, and 20 with research. And then right the wrongs. <laughs> you gotta love this. So 20% campaign movement range after winning a battle. Unbreakable when fighting against enemies with plus with a thousand plus grudges, and perfect vigor when fighting against enemies with a thousand <laughs> for his entire army for both of those. Holy shit! Like an entire Slayer army if you're fighting someone with a thousand grudges, and yeah, there's gonna be people with a thousand grudges that are gonna need to end up being end up dying. I do wonder 
like for instance, you may not get a thousand grudges on an army, but you may get a thousand. Uh, you may get a, co- a thousand through a combination of like the Salomon grudge and the army grudge. So I wonder if that's gonna count for that. Not sure. I haven't tested it that far. Like yeah, early look. Like there's a lot of things that need to be tested in terms of how um, how they work. Um, Grum Brindle. Uh, so Grum Brindle, largely the same. I don't think there's anything really changed over here. Nor did he need to. He had one of the most powerful skill lines in the entire freaking game. Um, but what's really useful is obviously you can acquire Grumbrindle through Confederation, through the Grudge Confederation mechanic, so you can get his really, really good uh, skill line, including 6% casualty replenishment. So what I'm saying here, through Grumbrindle in research, you can get 11% casualty replenishment. It doesn't end there, either. It doesn't end there. Uh, Ungrim, who I have... Over here, he's just recruiting a bunch of units because, yeah, we got a bunch of local uh, uh, recruitment benefits. Uh, he has a couple of changes. So his death blow has been changed to, at the top. So you have determined death blow. You have extremely daring death blow over there at the top. as kind of like a special skill line at the top. His slayer skill line uh, gives uh, terror, fear, dragon slayer uh, for slayers and himself. Demon slayer, ward save when fighting against warriors of chaos. So basically, actually just chaos factions in general. Doom slayers gives 10% casualty replenishment. So I think that was nerfed. I think it was 15%, but it's not really a nerf up because we also have this skill line over here. So it's not really a nerf. You get 10% ward save and journeys end upgraded, which I think journeys end is working properly now. It didn't for a very long time. 10% strength and missile strength for slayers. So, yeah, slayer pirates are a ranged unit. Uh, missile resistance for slayers. And uh, slayers to me. So I think this is something that the demon slayer lord does have as well. But I haven't really looked because I can't really talk about it. Right? I can't really showcase that. Um but you get 10% casualty replenishment for Slayer units and 10%. So you're, you with Ungram, you're getting 20% casualty replenishment. If the Demon Slayer has all of this, it will make a Slayer army far more viable for Ungram. But you do need to own the DLC. I think that's probably the takeaway from me. It's like, if you want to play an Ungram campaign proper, you can play it without the DLC. But I think the DLC is really going to benefit him. Uh, though one thing to note, if you don't have the DLC, Ungram under the control of the AI is the one who's going to get the new legendary hero. I'm not going to talk about it, just mentioning that one fact, because like it does happen in Sandbox. I do have him here, I'm not going to show him. However, um, which is a bit annoying because you can't really get rid of him, <laughs> by the way, when you confederate. It's like, so yeah, I kind of wish I could get rid of him, but all the same. Uh, so that's Ungrim, that's Forgrim. Uh, where's Belagar? There we go. Uh, Belagar, uh, again, largely the same. For most part, I don't think there's any particular change over here. Uh, although, except this one, I think, like construction costs for provincial capital settlement buildings. <laughs> yeah, it's like confederations are much easier and they change the skill lines to be biblically powerful. What the hell is he? It's like, you, it's like, we really like the dwarves. Like, they're treating the dwarves in a way that even the Skaven should be green with envy <laughs> over here. Like, remember how, how CA was accused in Warhammer 2 of really liking the Skaven? Holy shit, what they've done for the dwarves over here. Like, yeah, Belagar, damn. Holy crap. And then it's like Shattering Aura during Siege Battles. Producing leadership makes siege, uh, Sieges less annoying. Physical resistance, global recruitment, recruit rank benefits. I'm not. I think Forex's uh, skill line is mostly the same. You may ask, what about like the regular grudges that they had? Those are now just quest battles. Uh, so basically, with respect to that, it's like those kind of things, like regular grudges, like the old grudges, become quest battles. So it's like if you have like a grudge against Bretonia, like those can still trigger. You can still get like a mission. There's no penalties. There's just a benefit if you win like free battles against Bretonia. So that's how. Like the old grudge grudges, I don't think I've seen a raiding objective, but just like battle objective. So you no longer get like, oh, if action raid, then you have to raid them back or raid their race back. You no longer get that except like missions, which you can fly out and ignore if you uh, so desire. That, of course, leaves Forek, which, yeah, I mean, this campaign is already long enough for me, but I think Forek for most part is the same from what I've seen. Okay. 
let's go over lords. So you get regular lords and um, regular dwarf lords, and you get a rune lords. Let's go over what's changed. I do think I have a rune lord somewhere. Okay, so I have a fane. Um, okay, there, there's a rune lord. So what's changed for rune lords? They now have a choice over here. So I, if there's anything changed with Fork, it's probably the addition of this line. So you get a choice between three skills over here. So you can either increase melee attack and leadership for army, you can increase armor and physical resistance for army, you can increase casualty replenishment by 5%. So with Grum Brindle and Research, and you want Rat Catcher as quickly as possible, you can get 16% casualty replenishment for an army led by a Rune Lord. You then get magical attacks, weapon strength, physical resistance, reducing winds of magic, miscast based, uh, base chance, share cooldown for all master runes, and then the master of ancient lore, which decreases cooldown if engaged in melee. Outside of that, essentially the same thing that we had before. For a dwarf lord, for a fane, uh, yeah, for, well, sorry, for a dwarf lord, they also get a special skill line. So they get, um, and, and this is shared with uh, Forgorn. So you get Missile Block Chance, Physical Resistance, Weapon Strength, or Aura of Endurance over here, which um, affects allies in range, melee defense, missile resistance. Then you get Unit Experience plus 5%, Character Leadership, and you'll be able to pick all of this up. Physical Resistance for melee units, Recruit Rank, uh, Dwarf Miners, Recruitment Cost, and Local Recruitment Capacity. And then 5% campaign movement range and casualty replenishment. So regardless of which dwarf lord you're using of the two regular ones, you'll get 5% casualty replenishment. Or you can with rune lords if you so desire. You may decide not to go for it. So dwarf lords buff melee infantry, but also just in general buff the army, I would say. Uh, by the way, speaking about melee units for the dwarf, something I want to highlight here. You do get the shield wall ability for dwarf warriors, including the regiment they're now and long beards with shield. So the shield wall gives mass, missile block chance, missile resistance, and cannot run. You can enable it when um, when you're um, uh, when they're not uh, when they're out of melee. So you can form a real dwarf shield wall. So dwarf and melee is more viable. I mean quarreler doomstacks are obviously gonna still be really good, but with the range changes, funders are better uh, for instance, iron breakers uh, are bre better, troll hammers are better, gyrocopters are better, all that. So just worth pointing that out with regards to units. There are some changes, or rather there's not necessarily changes with the units. They're just new addition with respect to the research that does help uh, the melee units. Uh, whether or not you want to use that, that's up to you. In terms of heroes... Uh, Engineers, I think they're exactly the same. Maybe, you know, a couple of changes like over there with Flash Bomb. Fanes, um, yeah, pretty much. I, I think, like, you get a couple of changes like HP, like all the things at the top over here. So, Dalvia, Fority, HP, Armor, Melee Defense, and Glittering Scales, which reduces melee attack of enemies. And with Runesmiths, um, you get this particular skill line over here. Pretty sure that's new. So rune ability cooldown, magic item drop chance, spell resistance, miscast, uh, miscast base chance. So you get a lot more heroes. They're more powerful. You have a reason to use uh, regular dwarf lords because they're just going to be better in melee. And because you get so many runesmiths, you don't need them anymore for the sake of their for the sake of runesmithing. Because like due to the hero limitations, you would almost always want to get rune lords because you wanted the rune abilities, which are obviously powerful. Now you have a lot of reasons to use regular dwarf lords. You have reasons to diversify your army as uh, the dwarves, and you have plenty of reasons to do things in very different ways. So while the campaigns have largely stayed the same, and uh, I admit, like, if there's anything I would complain about, like, with Grum Brindle, is, like, he could re really could have used, like, some global missions, like Oxatl, where he teleports to help out the dwarves, because that's kind of one of the things he does in lore. But because of the distant confederations you can do for certain, doesn't require diplomacy, just, you just need to reach a grudge value, which you're going to reach anyway, uh, you, it does open up a 
ton more possibilities. Another thing I would add over here for the dwarves, just the final thing, is something important for Grumbrindle and Malachi, I imagine. All of Norska is now frozen. Also important for Kislev, like, if there's anyone who benefits actually from dwarf rework is Kislev, because, like, you got Malachi to protect you from the north. All of Norska is now mountain or frozen. Also for Grumbrindle, this particular province, or actually these particular provinces, are now frozen. So basically you can take all of this territory over here until the castaway, so that's where the castaways start, because it's frozen or mountains in, in respect to Norska. This opens up a, a lot of possibilities, and if you're playing a Kislev campaign, you actually now have a reason to play a campaign as Kislev in Kislev and Norska. But yeah, tons of possibilities uh, over here. Not sure if there's any new landmarks, maybe one over there in Krakadrag. So there's one with the Silver Hall. But yeah, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty much it. <laughs> it's, I admit, from my perspective, it's crazy. Oof. Like, I think... You can find, like, like, look, some people are going to say this and uh, that, oh, all of these are overpowered. Well, I'm just going to reply to that. You think that the dwarves in Empire had an easy time before? Because sure, they have to fight Festus, Draka, Vlad. Those are really powerful legendary lords in their own right, let alone their races being really powerful. Uh, same with, like, the Greenskins. Greenskins are an S-tier race as well, so it's not like, uh, so it's not like, oh, this is just gonna be a cakewalk. If you think fighting Grimgor is a cakewalk, though apparently Tamarkan has wiped them out over here, if you think fighting Grimgor is gonna be a cakewalk, uh, <laughs> I don't think so. It just evens the playing field. It makes it less annoying, like, makes it more rewarding and makes it more fulfilling. Um, I'm not going to give a definitive conclusion where I'd like rank the dwarves at the moment as a race. Let me know what you guys think about this. But yeah, this, I'll say this much. This has been a lot of fun. Like just playing the dwarves, I've played almost 40 hours in the patch, not the DLC, the patch, since I've gotten access to it. And it's like most of it has been in the dwarves. And it's like been a whole lot of fun. The racial rework makes each campaign more interesting, I think. Um, even if the campaigns themselves aren't changed in the way that Carl Franz and Gelt are changed in a fairly substantial way in their own right. That is all. Maybe I missed a couple of things. Let me know if I missed anything. But uh, stay tuned for more.